Hi, I'm Stuart Hicks from the Architecture with Stuart YouTube channel, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Choose your words carefully, Mr. Bond. They may be your last. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. (laughs) Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Auric Goldfinger was one of the most memorable evil villains in the James Bond 007 series. Played by Gert Frobe in the 1964 movie named for him, Goldfinger, this criminal mastermind created a scheme to corner the gold market by exploding a radioactive bomb over Fort Knox, the U.S. gold supply in Kentucky. And that was back when the nation's debt was a mere $311 billion and was backed by this gold. Kind of like putting up your house as collateral for a loan. Goldfinger's plan to make the gold radioactive and therefore inaccessible would make his own gold ten times more valuable, somehow. Bond foils this brilliant plan and lives to have a few of his well-loved martinis by the time the movie ends. A few years later, in real life there will be another villain, President Nixon, who said, hey, we're not going to put up our gold anymore as collateral, and woo doggies! We've uber-borrowed our unsecured selves all the way up to $29 trillion, more if you count unfunded Medicare and Social Security. Even James Bond cannot save us now. Goldfinger remains one of the most famous names in film, and joining us today is, like James Bond, the suave and sophisticated architect Myron Goldfinger, a classic name in mid-century modernism who's experiencing a new following in his 80s. But wait, there's more. We'll also have Master of the Ukulele, Victoria Vox, on later. And now, here's your host. Shaken, not stirred, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. And thanks for working in that Jed Clampett who doggies. <laughs> no problem. A callback to the classic TV show, The Beverly Hillbillies. It would have been so cool if the Clampets bought the Elrod House by John Lautner instead of that huge mansion. The Elrod House would later star, of course, in its own James Bond film, but I digress. Like anyone who's seen the Bond movies and likes martinis, I've compared the shaken to the stirred, and honestly, it's a toss-up. Certainly, the shaken version, if you get to see the bartender sling it around, is more entertaining. Yet with the explosion of distilleries and curated formulas, I have to say, like a father talking to twins, (laughs) I love shaken and stirred equally. Now, gin versus vodka, that's another story. The movie Goldfinger has a unique connection to modernist architecture other than sharing the last name of today's guest. There was another well-known architect, Hungarian Erno Goldfinger. James Bond's creator, author Ian Fleming, was mad at Erno Goldfinger for bulldozing Victorian homes in the UK to put up horrors, modernist houses. So he named the movie's villain Goldfinger. Aha! Uh-huh. Erno sued Fleming, and they settled out of court. Fleming got to keep the name in the book, Erno got paid off, and Fleming later said he was going to rename the book Gold Prick. (laughs) That didn't happen. (laughs) Orson Welles and Theodore Bakel were considered for the part of Goldfinger, but actor Gerd Frobe won out based on his performance as a child molester in a German film. I guess if you're looking for evil, that's where you go recruiting. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs, and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. It's Episode 7, Modernism Awakens, fearless rebel leader, freighter pilot, and former slave girl Princess Angela Roll has vanished. In her absence, the sinister five-story gray building code alliance has risen from the faux balconies and granite countertops and will not rest until Angela and the last modernists have been destroyed. On her frozen home world where the last Starbucks closed a generation ago and the mocha frappuccinos have to be made without coffee and without <laughs> mocha. Oh, no. Our pal General Kate Wagner leads a brave yet Java and chocolate-free resistance from her icy gingerbread fortress. She is desperate to find Angela and restore design harmony throughout the galaxy. 
four solar systems and a planet over, General Wagner's daring and the rules don't apply to me architect, Bjarke Lloyd Wright, is on a secret Starbucks run and discovers a clue to Angela's whereabouts at a price. Tune in next time when Lord Garth Vader's only son, Brad Vader, an orthodontist on the Wookiee homeworld, stops putting braces on Wookiees, which was never a fun job, and finally faces his father. Back here on Earth, this century's Angela Roll is your heroine of modernist houses, using her architectural training to specialize in modernist real estate, advising buyers and sellers on everything, from appropriate renovation to finding a good orthodontist without daddy issues. Angela Roll is your special real estate agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L. Or call 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Architect Myron Goldfinger, no relation to Erno or Oreck, is celebrated for his highly sculptural modernist houses. After growing up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, he studied architecture at the University of Pennsylvania under the great Louis Kahn, then served in the Army for two years, designing cabinetry at the Pentagon. In 1957, he moved to New York and worked for landscape architect Carl Lynn, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, SOM, and Philip Johnson in the Seagram Building. In 1966, Goldfinger went on his own, doing first remodels around New York City, out of an I.M. Pay apartment in Kipps Bay Towers, which he still owns. His Jaroslow house was a star in the movie Wolf of Wall Street, and Goldfinger wrote the 1969 book Villages in the Sun, which includes a preface by Louis Kahn, and he also wrote Images of the Southwest, the Goldfinger Caribbean, and Myron Goldfinger Architect. You can find all these wonderfully photographed books, as well as all his houses, at usmodernist.org slash Goldfinger. Welcome, Myron. It's nice to be here. So, Myron, what was your life like after Goldfinger came out in 1964? Well, uh, basically, I was teaching at the University Pratt Institute here in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And you could imagine what uh, it was like with the students. I became the hero of uh, Pratt Institute at that time. <laughs> but before that, in serving in the Army, when you mentioned the name Goldfinger, before being uh, fortunately transferred to the Pentagon, I served early basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And at that time, being a nice Jewish boy from Atlantic City, I had this uh, wonderful Southern sergeant, and he named me Gold F***. <laughs> oh, so, no. That was my first name in relation to, uh, to the Goldfinger name. Did you ever get to meet British architect Erno Goldfinger? Never did. However, we met his attorney long after he passed on and found out the story in regards to Fleming's book and what happened, because it was a vacant lot next to Fleming's Victorian house in London. And Fleming really got very, very upset and tried to stop him from building this modernist house. And, well, it, it didn't work. And in the end, the house was built, and uh, the name Goldfinger became very, very significant to the world. I don't know who knew the name Goldfinger before that time and Besides especially you. the movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Especially the movie after the book was done. So you go back a ways in that you studied with Lewis Kahn, who we've talked about on the show many times. What was he like as a professor? He was absolutely incredible, except you could not understand him so much of the time because he was such a unique individual, and the way he would express himself in terms of materials and in terms of basic architecture was incredible. But he would go on and on, and one would spend hours, and half the time he was thinking in a world of his own, and absolutely incredible. But the point is, I hope that some of my work rubbed off because of him, 
And because of also our friendship, he became close friends with myself and my wife for many, many years. It was certainly a tragic end. Uh, The sad part is that there should have been 20 more years of doing some interesting buildings because he would never stop in terms of his thought processes. Also, by the way, at the University of Pennsylvania, I was very fortunate to have, in addition to Lou, a close relationship with Paul Rudolph. Paul Rudolph, before he was famous, he had done the Cocoon House and a few other things in Sarasota, and he would come up to the University of Pennsylvania for the fall semester in his Riley convertible. And Paul and I became friends later on when he settled in New York. And we would have lunch at the uh, Russian Tea Room, where we both had chicken Kiev for lunch. And Paul was an incredible person also. Myron, the first house that we can find for you was one you did in 1965 for Alan Herskovitz on Barnegat Bay. Beautiful little small modernist house. Is it still around? We tried to find it a couple of years ago. And it may have been destroyed in one of the hurricanes along the New Jersey shore. We're not sure. And, of course, there's a lot of houses that have been built. And it was a lovely house, uh, my first house, like a small uh, Richard Neutra house, in a sense. Very pure, very simple. And I did get a lot of publicity from that house. And the house we have for you after that was the one you did for the Petricellis in Southampton. And this is where you really kind of hit your stride with these geometric volumes. Well, but actually the next house was the house we built for ourselves in Wacobuck in New York, where we still live. Our house and studio is here. And that was a house that was conceived in 1967 and was able to be built and finished in 1970, which was very difficult because it was in a community where there were only traditional homes and they objected to seeing this unique modern house Fortunately, after several years, we were able to build the house. I was fortunate that after the construction, House and Garden, the New York Times, and Record Houses of the Year. Oh, everybody all three, covered it, yeah. All three covered it in May of 1971. And in a sense, that really put me on the map as an architect. Even Alan Dunn, the cartoonist did a a neat feature about you in Architecture Record featuring the house. Yes, he he did. That was the issue of Architectural Record, uh, Record Houses of the Year, that my house was illustrated. And if you don't know who Alan Dunn is, he is one of, well, he was really the last great architectural cartoonist. It's a very small group, (laughs) naturally. Couldn't name uh, another one. but If you Google Alan Dunn cartoons, you can see some really funny drawings and jokes and sort of inside scoop about mostly modernist architecture from the, I guess, around the late 40s through the 70s. It was incredible, and it it was an honor as a young architect to have that cartoon in architectural and record houses of the year. And as I scroll through this list of houses on our website, they just get sort of bigger and bolder and badder as we go along. The Stephen Rose House in Nyack, New York. It just like looks like something you could build out of a movie today. You got some great clients here that were commissioning these houses. Well, one thing led to another. And you mentioned before about the Petroselli house. Now, Petroselli was an old boyfriend of my wife's. And he was a very, very famous photographer. He did, at that time, all the original black and white great Volkswagen ads. I don't know if you remember those. The ones with a a lot of white space in the ad? 
Yeah, and, and they were in all subway stations and billboards and everywhere. So fortunately, I met Tony and his wife, Nina, who is a, a fashion model, and he bought a plot of land on the beach in Bridgehampton out in Long Island. So, of course, June introduced me, and we we hit it off. This was the next house after our own that I designed. And at that time, there were very few houses along the beach in the Hamptons. And it was rather striking to see this among the dunes. This was very important to me as the next progression of my work. Unfortunately, in later years, as they moved on to the West Coast and people who bought it hired uh, some architect, whoever, and they completely destroyed the whole house. You would not recognize it today, unfortunately, from what it was on Dune Road in uh, Bridgehampton. Well, that does happen, unfortunately, over time. Well, it's happened to a couple of my houses, and one is quite unique here because I had designed a house. People lived for about 20 years and moved off to Wyoming. And they sold it to someone who, after the sale, they made a deal with the local fire department to use the house as a training exercise. What? And they, oh, and oh, they no. burned down sections of the house until it was completely destroyed and built a terrible uh, traditional-style mega house, <laughs> which is incredible, but that's what happens. And, I mean, you know, just like the Larkin building for Frank Lloyd Wright and other places that have been destroyed, but I think this is probably unique. This may be the only house that was intentionally burned down in sections. We had a small modernist office building here in Raleigh, North Carolina, that when um, it got sold, it got turned into a shooting range for police what? to go out and practice hostage negotiations and other kinds of uh, oh. paramilitary maneuvers, and they were shooting up the buildings. Oh, that's got to hurt. Yeah, that's got to hurt. It's sad because this was a very, very good building. I mean, you know, at that time, you know, one of my best works. But unlike other artists, that's it. You know, if someone buys your property and... They can do whatever they want with it, and uh, that's one of the sad things about architecture, especially if you do consciously good architecture or special architecture, that there's no guarantee. Well, one of your houses, Myron, became a movie star. The Fred Jaroslaw House, he was the CEO of Weight Watchers, and the house you did for him? He was a great client, one of the best, and a wonderful person. And he let me do whatever I wanted. It was a very strong, unusual house, which was featured in Architectural Digest, among other publications. And why do you think they picked it for The Wolf of Wall Street, which was in 2013? I don't know, because Scorsese, obviously, they must have looked for houses all over the Hamptons, all over Long Island. This is on the North Shore. And for some reason, it just fit the bill that they thought this was a unusual and interesting house. And especially that from a helicopter, the shot of the large party of hundreds of people standing out around the pool and the house is is there in all its splendor. Another house of yours that was quite a celebrity was the Robert Connison House in Sagaponak which was on the TV show's Royal Pains, and I think even an episode of Louie a number of years ago. Well, that that was a wonderful house, and it it was just sold a few years ago for uh, $29.5 million. It was built for about a million (laughs) dollars. And so Bob Connison passed on, and his attorney was really, she was the one, his wife, who sponsored that house. And the taxes got so high 
uh, like a half a million dollars a year. So she unfortunately felt she had to sell it a number of years ago, but financially she made out quite well. For anyone that's interested, you can rent the house these days. It'll cost you $500,000 a month to rent. So in, in one month, maybe that covers the property tax? Maybe it does. In one month, the taxes. <laughs> wow. And then about that time, Myron, you started working a lot in the Caribbean. Well, when I was a professor at Pratt Institute, we would have five weeks every year off from Christmas to the beginning of February. So what I would do each year, I would take my two young girls and my wife, and we'd go to the Caribbean to a different island, three different islands each year. There would be two dry islands with a wet island in between. So now, we... of course, having grown up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, by the beach, this was something very dear to me. And we finally had the opportunity to find a piece of property on one of the remote islands at that time, Anguilla. It was difficult to get to, and there was a wonderful piece of beachland property that we acquired, and we had to have a road brought in for a quarter mile, and electricity, and everything was very, very primitive at that time. So we developed a resort called Cove Castles. It started out as four villas, our house, and three others similar on this beach, and later it expanded and I was able to incorporate four more interesting villas for some very prominent business people. One was Edgar Bronfman, the uh, oh. heir to the was it Seagram's? Seagram family. Yeah. Yeah. Seagram, A yes. liquor man. And Bob Johnson, he and his wife invented BET, mm -hmm. Black Entertainment Television. And the largest of all the villas were for someone who has been considered one of the most important businessmen in the world right now, Leonard Blavatnik, and he was an ideal client. His house was the largest and the most interesting of all the houses that we developed. We spent a lot of time in the Caribbean at the time. And it was also an opportunity for me because everything built there was in concrete. I had never done concrete buildings before. Everything in the Hamptons and in the States because cost considerations was all of wood construction. So I built those houses in the Caribbean because of problems of occasional earthquakes, believe it or not. And also the, of course, hurricane. Flooding, yes. My model was the Imperial Hotel by Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, where everything was tied together. The foundation, the roof, the floors, the walls, into one unified concrete form. And therefore, it would hold up under any circumstances. And also because of the prevailing winds, the shapes and forms of the houses were unusual. During construction, the workers, uh, and there were about a hundred of them, would come from the other end of the island and bring their families on the weekends because of to see these unusual structures that they were working on with these quarter round roofs and uh, strange shapes. So it was an attraction locally. It was. It, it was the first of anything modern on the island. Now, Myron, how do you approach the design of a vacation home differently than, say, a primary residence? Well, basically, I think it's pretty much the same. It just depends on where the vacation house is. And in the Caribbean, well, of course, when you're on a beach, the main view is looking out. Uh, to the water and to neighboring islands. But basically, I look upon the architecture uh, as the same. It's dealing with spaces and the experience 
So I look at vacation houses as well as individual houses, as well as remodeling apartments and townhouses as the same. Now, what have been some of the most challenging clients or sites in your career so far? Well, you know, most of the sites I've had have not been unique in terms of cliffs and various forms. The The only thing is we built ourselves a vacation house in Tusuki, New Mexico, which is high up on the uh, hill in an area where it's very, very difficult to reach, but it has a spectacular view. And I would say that's probably was the most difficult site because of just bringing up equipment, especially the concrete trucks, which was, was almost impossible because it has a winding road of about a half a mile uh, to get to the, uh, the house. Now, Myron, tell us about your foundation, the Goldfinger Foundation for the Visual Arts. Well, we started a foundation many years ago because we wanted to do something for the various artists and museums, and therefore we decided that would be our area of interest. We were particularly interested in folk art. We have amassed a large collection. We feel very good about doing things for the arts and trying to do what we can because it's our major interest in life. Well, thank you so much for doing that. And and thank you for this incredible legacy of houses that you have done. It's just amazing to look at them on the website. Well, thank you very much. You can see all of Myron's houses as well as his books. And one of the things I love about one of Myron's books is called Goldfinger's Caribbean. And uh, it's Myron lounging in a lounge chair on the beach. That's the cover of the book. (laughs) It's so cool. Oh, yes, sure. Okay. (laughs) That is you, right? Well, well, thank you. This this was taken by the the manager of of our resort when I was out there one day. You know, when when you build 16 vacation villas, one has the, the right to be able to appreciate and lay out on the beach for a period of time. Absolutely. Myron, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Give our best to your wife, June. Oh, thank you very much. Award-winning performer Victoria Vox is originally from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Go Packers. She's been a songwriter since the age of 10, playing keyboard and guitar. She studied at the Berklee College of Music in Boston and in 2003 took up the ukulele. In 2006, she released her first ukulele album and her Jumping Flea, and Victoria has lived all over the place, in France, England, Nashville, Baltimore, and now Costa Mesa, California. She performs mostly solo, incorporating a loop pedal and a bass effect on her ukulele and the mouth trumpet, which she performed on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Welcome, Victoria. Hello. <laughs> it's like Seinfeld. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so my my first question, Victoria, what is a mouth trumpet? And did we just hear it? Well, yeah. That was it. <laughs> oh wow. That works. It's, I can't uh, tell it from the real thing. It's an old jazz uh, era vocal technique of emulating a horn with one's voice. I started mouth trumpeting in two thousand five. And when I realized that this was something I wanted to get really good at, I kind of went into uh, Chet Baker's music a lot because I could sing along with his songs and then also then trumpet along with his trumpet. So how did you come to do the mouth trumpet on Jay Leno? Well, I guess I had been... So when I first started mouth trumpeting, it was probably a pretty sad sound, kind of... You know, it wasn't. there wasn't a lot of articulation and... Um, but as I was listening to more horn players and also having been a trumpet player in high school band, knowing the mechanics of a trumpet, started to really um, dig into having a better mouth trumpet sound. And so it was actually at a 
ukulele festival in Dallas in 2009 when there was an older gentleman there who had just, he wanted to video me doing my mouth trumpet. And I made sure it was like, now, you know, Joseph, this is just for your own personal, you know, video collection. This won't be posted anywhere. He's like, Oh no. He bought a new (laughs) computer at the Mac store. They helped him edit a video and post it to YouTube. That video? And it was my video. Oh, no. <laughs> but that was the video that the producers at the Jay Leno show found. So thankfully, Joseph accidentally uploaded that video. <laughs> but they were doing a segment on the show called Meal or No Meal, where they find people with odd talents. Yep. And then their that. comedian judges decide of whether or not your weird talent is worthy <laughs> of a meal. <laughs> And did you win? I did. Where did you go to dinner? At Benny Hanna. Benny oh, Hanna, of wow. course. Yes, that's, that's nice. the Tonight Show staple. So, did you take up the mouth trumpet after you took up ukulele? Yes, I guess it was just a couple years later, and I had a bad habit at the time of driving and playing my ukulele at the same time, writing songs in the car, going from gig to gig. How do you how do you drive and play the <laughs> ukulele? Tell me how that even works. <laughs> Well, you just lower the steering wheel enough that you got a good grip with your left knee. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it is a small instrument. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the one thing. I have tried playing guitar behind the wheel, and you definitely have to roll the window down. At which point the police notice. <laughs> yeah. What did the police even say when they pull you over and you've got a ukulele in your lap? Well, I usually hide it underneath the, you know, the wheel, the passenger wheel well. <laughs> what ukulele? I don't know what you're talking about, officer. <laughs> That's 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 a great skill. I have never heard that one. Well, my dad was a rally, like kind of a race car driver. He loved racing cars, motorcycles, and he had been up to the Arctic Circle doing rallies. And so my dad always drove with his knees. And mostly it was just kind of like to, you know, get a rile out of us in the car because he'd be like, hey, look, no hands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And so I, I do say I do I did learn how to drive with my knees for my dad. <laughs> That's a good dad trick for sure. Victoria, in 2011, is it true you learned a cover song every week for a whole year? Yes, uh, that was my 52 covers project that I did on YouTube, and I had started that year. I was feeling kind of kind of low. And I woke up one morning singing, I think it's going to rain today by Randy Newman. And it was the the lonely, lonely part. And I'm thinking like, this is a really good song. I I should learn how to play it. And so that I spent the whole day learning that song. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to post this. And then it was like, I hit record on the camera. And then I'm like, and welcome to the 52 song <laughs> or the song pro- like <laughs> cover song project. And I just kind of, I think it was me stepping out of myself, my songwriter self for a little bit and um, just challenging me to become a better ukulele player and learn more songs and learn through the songs of other people. And it turned out to be a really great and exhausting project. Which of those songs got the most traction for you? Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I get requests for, I guess the ones that I enjoyed playing the most were like Physical by Olivia Newton-John. And uh, okay, <laughs> um, probably on the internet, it's a, there's a, I do a cover, a Spanish, it's actually a Cuban song called Chan Chan by Compay Segundo. And it was in, it was kind of the theme opening popular track from the Buena Vista Social Club. Yeah, yeah. So I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> just, I just learned it phonetically and then did mm-hmm. the mouth trumpet solo with that. Well, this first song was written by Herb Oda and Jim Beloff. Here's Victoria with French Café.
So after doing a cover song every week for a year, you upped the ante the next year and wrote a completely new song every week. Yes. <laughs> and I had no idea that I was going to be doing this two-year kind of two-part project. And I will say that after writing a song a week for the year, I definitely felt more rejuvenated and I felt I could have, I could have kept going. With wow. the cover songs, it really was exhausting and because um, I was also touring at the same time. So it was traveling and learning these songs and doing these weekly videos. And then when I did the songwriting project, I kind of hunkered down and stayed home. And uh, it was really fun just having a clean slate every week. And one might think that, oh my gosh, I have to write 52 songs, how daunting that can be. And I really just took it week by week. And uh, it was amazing that I successfully completed it. <laughs> so you did wind up composing 52 new songs. Yes. And I put out a coffee table book to um, super supporters. And I just made a hundred, I, I think 125 copies of the book. I saved every lyric draft, napkin, piece of paper, scrap, whatever, and um, compiled it all into a book. Now, had you done much songwriting before that year? Yes, probably not to that extent. I mean, I started writing songs when I was 10, so I've always been writing songs, and I'm about to put out my 12th record okay. of uh, original music since my ukulele departure in 2003. But uh, yeah, so I was always, you know, I'm, I'm a creative. I love making stuff and songs, and when I was a kid, I would hear songs on the radio and think like, you know, ultimately somebody just made this up. Like, <laughs> I want to make up songs. <laughs> it sounds like an airline, you know, your your ukulele departure, now leaving <laughs> gate three. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> She'll be back on tour. Yeah. <laughs> where is the best ukulele scene, Victoria? Like, where do all the great players hang out? Ooh, that's a tough one. I think they're all over. Um, you know, and the ukulele scene has grown so much since I first joined. Well, when I first started playing in 2003, I didn't know any other ukulele players. And, you know, when I put out the Jumping Flea album, it was kind of like, it was that exploring and trying to research, like, where do I promote this? Or so I would start looking up Jumping Flea. And then it was all of a sudden like the Los Angeles Flea Circus ukulele group <laughs> or the jumping fleas or the free jumper. There was just like, all of a sudden I was like, Oh, my jumping flea title isn't that creative. And I got it because ukulele means uku means flea and lele means jumping in Hawaiian. Oh. Um, but it turns out I was not the first to uh, come up with that. <laughs> so there were jumping fleas and flea circuses all over the country. And Jim Biloff, who you mentioned who is a co-writer of French cafe, I call him the ukulele ambassador and at flea market music, he had kind of a database and collection of people and any, you know, ukulele lovers across the country so that people could get together and play. So I went to my first, the first New York ukulele festival in 2006 from that festival meeting James Hill, who's a virtuoso player in Nova Scotia you know, there was a guy from France who also did some mouth trumpet. And it was just kind of this. You it's found your tribe. Yeah. Journey, you know, but they're, every, they're all over. I mean, there's a lot of Hawaiian ukulele players, but there's different styles. Like um, there's Paris groups. I've been to Italy to play ukulele. And there's so many different styles of music that you can play with a ukulele. And I think that's probably a common misconception with ukulele. They're like, oh, ukulele music. And it's like, well, what is ukulele music? Yeah, it's a like hula you can play music jazz. or something. You can yeah. play, yeah, it's yeah. like piano music. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Is it Ben Folds piano? or are we <laughs> Right, right. Or Rachmaninoff. So it's, <laughs> yeah, I've seen punk ukulele and rock ukulele and, you know, island ukulele and classical ukulele. And there, it's just, you know, it's really just comes down to what people enjoy playing and what kind of music they're into. Well, tell us about this new song, Clean. Yeah, so this is the opening track on my new record. It's the first single that just came out. The whole album is inspired by artwork by an artist named Fred Stonehouse. And he has these really bizarre, mystical paintings 
that a lot of them that are kind of humanized creatures that might resemble something of like a crocoduck. <laughs> <laughs> and so obviously nothing really exists. Um, but there are a lot of these paintings came to, to him or ideas came to him like in dream state or like waking up from a dream. So a lot of it is kind of the connection of reality and dream logic. So Queen was inspired by a painting of Fred's called The Crossing. And a lot of his paintings have little phrases or titles painted in them. And so this one was a creature, a winged jaguar creature, kind of looking back, a tear falling. And there were some butterflies kind of hanging around. And it, on the top, it said the difficulties of the crossing. But also, I wrote this song a few weeks after the insurrection. And there was a story on the news about the Reffitt family where the one of the men at the insurrection had threatened his children that he would kill them if they turned him into the FBI. Oh, and the I heard son about him. did. Yeah. And so I, you know, it kind of made me think, like, how do we move past that? <laughs> You know, just in family relationships, and I've had, a, you know, I had a falling out with my father for four years where we did not speak, and there was a point where I knew that if I wanted my dad in my life, I was to never expect an apology, and that it really was moving forward, and we all, you know, we didn't talk about the past, and I'm just thinking, like, gosh, like, if a family member, like, threatened to kill me, like, I don't know how, how forgivable that is or you know like what's christmas going to be like next yeah. year for yeah. that what's thanksgiving going to be like <laughs> yeah a little awkward yeah, yeah. And, and so it's the lyric is you know can we start clean i won't let this anger get the better of me and looking behind us will only blind us every time from her new album victoria vox and clean i've been thinking a lot lately how all of this has changed me I'll even admit I was wrong It doesn't matter what the truth is Or who or why or what is If we both agree to move on Can we start clean? I won't let this anger get the better of me Every time Can we start clean And stop looking for answers For everything No mentioning triggers Or pointing our fingers And give up the fight Can we start clean Nice. Very moving. Thank you. Victoria, where can people uh, reach you on the web? Well, I've got a great website, victoriavox.com. 
and the, so double V's, V as in Victor or Victoria, Victoria Vox. And I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, you know, all the socials. But um, at my website, you can um, pick up the new album, which is a book with the artwork and all sorts of stuff. Uh, ukulele themed underpants, you know, whatever you like. <laughs> wow. Ukulele <laughs> themed like. underpants. Okay. That's a new product I had not even thought <laughs> for him existed. or her. <laughs> well, I also carry boxer briefs for men. So oh. just let me know oh. your sizes and I'll send over a couple pairs. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. Such a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by... Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows. Discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song, which you didn't hear this time, was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino is a mild-mannered mom of two by day, but by night she's our best secret agent, saving modernist houses from destruction through her worldwide network of rock and roll archivists. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild, George, and I'll be back soon with another edition of Her Majesty's Not-So-Secret Service, the one Prince Charles loves to hate, U.S. Modernist Radio. Radio.